All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Treasurer Powell. And uh, you told me you read the book, and, I, and obviously you have, because you've picked out a nugget in chapter two that I'm sure you wouldn't have gotten just from reading the Amazon blurb. And uh, thank you, Anita, for having me here. So uh, it's nice to be back in, in Chapel Hill. I looked on the agenda and saw this, uh, uh, agen saw the agenda from 30 years ago, and uh, I think it was January of 90, 95, 85, and I was actually at, at the time, I uh, don't know where I was exactly, but I'm sure I was in Chapel Hill engrossed in some class there. So when I got my PhD at Chapel Hill, one of the things that we studied, or I studied, was, was the North Carolina innovation economy and all the amazing things that were going on then. So what I want to talk about today, really, um, by the way, let me mention ITIF, for those of you who don't know it, it's ITIF.org, and we just ranked the second uh, leading technology policy think tank in the world uh, by a University of Pennsylvania. There's a lot of great resources on there. Uh, on any basically issue around innovation or innovation policy you can imagine. So in my time, I want to talk about three things. What's going on in the innovation environment and how it's different? How does North Carolina stack up to that? And what's the role of government in driving innovation? So it's kind of obvious, everybody knows this, but it's worth saying. Innovation is responsible for at least 75% of per capita income growth. In fact, in some models around the world, it's up, up to 90% of it. So it's the idea of doing new things, particularly in the business environment, that is responsible for driving uh, in, improvements in our standard of living. So let me give you a few, I think, big major changes in the innovation environment. In 1970, the Department of Defense employed one out of every 20 scientists and engineers in the world. Think about that. DOD had 20% of scientists and engineers in the world. Today, they have one out of every 200. In the 1960s, the US government alone funded more R&D than the rest of the world, government and business combined. Today, that's down to 8.4%. So if you want to know one of the major reasons why the U.S. leads in innovation today, although that lead is slipping, which I'll talk about in a moment, you have to look at this. We put an enormous amount of resources, of money and manpower and talent behind innovation, and we got a big lead. Now, unfortunately, as I'll say, that lead is slipping. One of the reasons that lead is slipping is we have failed at the national level to keep up with that commitment. If we kept the same share of government R&D to the, to the economy that we had in the 1960s, we would have to increase the federal R&D budget by $180 billion today. That's just to get back to where we were in the 60s. If we did that, by the way, North Carolina would be getting $4 billion a year from the federal government, more than, we get, more than you get today. So, did this matter? You're going to hear maybe a different view a little later. I think it mattered. You can see all of these innovations, and these are just a small number of them, that can trace their origins back to federal R&D. Obviously, the internet, we all know about that. The Google search engine, GPS, seismic imaging, the shale gas revolution, one of the big drivers of what's happening today in growth, that was a result of DOE uh, R&D back, back in the 80s. So let me ask, uh, there we go. So let me ask you a question. Which of the following companies cannot trace their origins to at least some part of federal funding? So if you want to take out your devices to vote. Um, boy, OK, so Jim, Jim is here, and I guess he's voting. Amazon, Google, IBM, Oracle, or SAS, which of those companies didn't trace their origins back to federal funding. So give everybody 10 more seconds. OK, what do we got? Uh, OK, well, very good, excellent group, Amazon. Google, IBM, Oracle, SAS Institute all had federal funding at some point in their early stages. 
And let's see where we go here. So these are some of the, I don't know why this is going up so slow. These are some of the companies that can go back. You can trace their origins to federal support for R&D. R&D is, innovation is not like growing wheat. It's not like opening a shoe store. It's incredibly complex, takes a lot of knowledge, and that's why it's so important for the federal government to play a role here. So Anita asked earlier, what's changed today? Let me t talk about three big things that I think are different today in the innovation environment. One of them, as I said, the U.S. is playing a much smaller role. If you look at what all these other countries are doing over the last 15 years, they are making big, big bets. They are doubling down on supporting R&D. You look at Sweden, up 34%. Actually, that number's too low because they just did a massive increase in their R&D budget. Now, for those of you who want to say, well, Sweden's just a socialist, uh, big government country, uh, Sweden actually just lowered its corporate tax rate, again, for the second time, down to 22%. And at the same time, they increased their R&D funding. These other countries are basically taking the playbooks from the right and the left and combining them. They're getting a better business environment, they're lowering taxes, and they're increasing government support for innovation because they know that they're all in this, what we call in our book, the race for global innovation advantage. This is really the big story. Since 2000, China has played a major role. They now uh, are one of the, they're the leading technology exporter. They, uh, if you look at patenting, they went from essentially 16,000 global patents, these are not just Chinese in domestic patents, global patents, up to 734,000. You want to know where the major technology challenge facing American companies is from today, it's China not just because they're patenting more, but because they're engaged in what we call systemic innovation mercantilism, systemic manipulation of the government in order to give Chinese companies an unfair advantage over American companies. The other big challenge we see today is U.S. companies are cutting back their early stage R&D, basic and applied research, and they're putting more and more into development. Now, that's good for the company, perhaps, certainly good for the company in the short term, but it's not good for the economy in the long run, and it's probably not good for the company in the long run. Companies are doing that in part because they're facing short-term pressures, but also because they're facing enormous pressures from China to keep costs down. The other thing now is because large companies are cutting back on their R&D, we see that they only account for 50% of R&D uh, down from 75% 30 years ago when you first had this conference. We can say, well, we'll rely on the VC community. VCs are doing the exact same thing. The amount of money going into first and early stage zero and first stage deals is actually down while the amount of money going into later stage deals is up. So in a way, why are we surprised when we hear statements like this? Peter Thiel's famous comment, we wanted flying cars, instead we got 140 characters. Clay Christensen talking about how companies are putting many of their investments in uh, keeping uh, assets down so that return on net assets are up. So I think there's a real challenge with how the economy is structured, the incentives facing our companies. We now have the 27th least generous research and development tax credit in the world. Back when we first did this conference, you did this conference, we had the most generous R&D tax credit in the world. So we're giving our innovators a lot fewer incentives to innovate. Now the other obviously big thing, you heard that this morning from Don Tapscott, IT is continuing to drive innovation. There are now 1,200 quintillion transistors in the world. I have no idea what that means, but it's a lot of zeros. Now, just in the last 15 years, we've increased the number of transistors in the world by 14,300 times. So that's why we we're talking, that's why we have all of this IT innovation. Transistors are super cheap. Now, the real important question is, where's that all going to go? And I would differ from a lot of the folks who look at this. I actually think what we're going to see going forward is a slowing down of that process, what engineers call Moore's Law, which has been doubling a chip size, a chip density every 24 months, I think we're probably facing some kind of slowdown over the next five years or so, or after five years, 
And then we're going to be in a little bit different environment where we're not going to see continued cost reductions as we have, and we're going to have to come to grips with what that means. The last big thing I think, and I say this because I think it has real implications for local economies and state economies. You know, for a long time, North Carolina and other states went after manufacturing because that was the thing that was mobile. You, you, you might have people buy cars in North Carolina or buy shirts or buy TVs, but they could be made anywhere in the world. Now, more and more of the economy is essentially traded because of IT. So yes, if I take an Uber ride to the airport, the driver is still going to have to be here. But all of the value on top of that goes to Silicon Valley. We're seeing that more and more, where we're going to see, I think, disruption in many, many industries that you have long relied on as a local economy that potentially now could all be done at a distance. Higher ed, uh, wealth management. There are Silicon Valley companies that want to disrupt that industry, so all the people who go to their local wealth management advisors, they won't do that anymore. They'll go online. So I think that's a big, big change, and I think what it means is economies can't rely on a lot of what they used to be able to rely on necessarily. Okay, so how's North Carolina doing in all of this? So let me start with just a question. North Carolina per capita income as a share of U.S. per capita income. What year did that peak? Now, 2014, by the way, is just pretend that means now, uh, that, it's never, that it's never peaked. Uh, 2014 is the, just the latest data we have available. So what year did that peak? Okay, you are a very good group that has either seen my slides ahead of time or you know a lot about the North Carolina economy. Here we go. 1999. So if you go back and look at the history of North Carolina, back in the Great Depression, less than 50% of per capita income in the U.S. North Carolina was a very, very poor state. And what you saw is this constant trend, a little bit of dip there in the late, early 80s, continuing up, riding the, riding the wave in the 90s, and then something happened. And what happened, I would argue, is China. So North Carolina's whole competitive position was based on one proposition. We're cheaper than, every, than the North. That was the proposition for a long, long time. You are really, really expensive compared to China. You're really expensive compared to Mexico. So the notion that a place can compete only on cost, or even principally on cost, worked quite well until around 2000, and it doesn't work now. We see the same thing with manufacturing earnings as a share of the US. North Carolina manufacturing earnings peaked even earlier, in the early 90s, which is really surprising, because everybody in the 90s thought North Carolina was this manufacturing boom state. But what was happening was this slow erosion, again, because many of the industries here were based upon cost advantages, routinized commodity-based production. Okay. So this is a report. I think you might have seen it in the video. This report we've done now every few years since 1999. And what it does is it measures the states on a whole bunch of different structural variables of how their economies are structured to be successful in this new global innovation economy. Things like knowledge jobs, globalization, economic dynamism, digital economy, and innovation capacity. So let me just run through a few. I think you saw that earlier. North Carolina ranks somewhat in the middle here, uh, 23rd, 25th, 24th. Uh, and if you look at the states that do quite well on this index, so combine all of these variables together, knowledge workers, high-tech jobs, venture capital, broadband. What you see are states like Massachusetts, uh, Virginia, Washington. So the coasts that do quite well, but what I think the goal for North Carolina should be is to get that blue just extended down one more state. So have the trend go from North Carolina all the way up to uh, New Hampshire. 
Well, let me just go through a few quickly. Professional and managerial and technical jobs is a share of the economy. North Carolina's 29th. IT jobs, these are, by the way, IT jobs not at SAS. IT jobs not in the IT industry, uh, which is pretty good. North Carolina's 14th. High tech jobs, 12th, again, very, very good. Workforce education, we've heard a number of panelists talk about that. That's still a challenge. What this is is simply a measure of the number of years of schooling for the workforce. But, by the way, that's an interesting number because when you look at metro areas, the triangle has, I think, the highest amount of education of any region in the country. So you have very high levels and obviously very, um, quite low levels. Fast growing firms, 21. Initial public offerings, that's actually a very good number, seven. I don't know why that is. Maybe there was one or two big IPOs, but that's a nice number. Scientists and engineers, 23rd. Again, a little, a little troubling given the fact that you have at least three great research universities right here that are turning out world-class scientists and engineers. Uh, perhaps they're not staying. Patents, 29. Industry investment in R&D, a key variable, a key factor. You don't just want to have branch plant high-tech companies here. You want high-tech companies that are investing in R&D here and new product development. Uh, venture capital, 22. Okay, so that gives you a sense of kind of where North Car Carolina is. Pretty good on some, not so good on others. Middle of the road overall, if you will. So let me just close by talking a little bit about what's the government role in innovation. What should government be doing here? I'm not going to go into sort of my normal talk, which is about what could North Carolina do. I certainly have some thoughts on that. But if you want to get deeper into that, just go to the website and look at the State New Economy Index, where we list many, many different specific policy ideas. There's also a report on our website uh, called 50 Ways to Leave Your Competitiveness Woes Behind, where we list a whole bunch of specific ideas that states can do, like innovation vouchers that Connecticut is doing. So what's the government role? Well, at one level, it's a question that really is about what do you think, how do you envision innovation occurring? How does it actually happen? So there's one set of views that says, look, innovation is just like wheat or shoes. It's, it's, there's, there's markets, there's supply, there's demand. Uh, entrepreneurs see that, they go and invest. Hopefully they're customers, hopefully they make money, and if they make more money, they get more investment. It's a beautiful cycle. That's one view. And I think that works quite well, by the way, for things like wheat and shoes. But when it comes to innovation, it's a fundamentally different ball game. Innovation is not producing wheat. It's not selling pizzas. It's about a complex innovation ecosystem where all the parts have to work together or else it just doesn't maximize the results. And so that's why I think this notion that just having the market alone Getting rid of government barriers, which, by the way, don't underestimate the importance of government barriers. We just issued a, a, a report uh, two days ago or last week where we, launched, we announced the top 10, the top Luddite award of the year. And what that was was we looked at 10 things that either governments or other groups have done to oppose innovation in 2014. We put it up on the web and we asked people to vote. Had around 1,500 votes. The winner was states that have opposed and prevented Tesla from having direct sales uh, in dealerships. No car dealers out here, I take it. There are lots of things governments do that are anti-innovation. But there's a lot of things they can do that are pro-innovation. So what we need, essentially, is an innovation economics approach. Uh, this is a, my, uh, my, my hero, Joseph Schumpeter, sort of the godfather of economics, innovation economics. And what he talked about was that markets relying on price signals alone will not be as effective as smart public-private partnerships. Okay. So, I don't want to be controversial, but I'm trying to be a little tongue-in-cheek here because you just hear this over and over and over again. The government can't pick winners, only business can. Sure, government could do bad things, but at least they didn't pick the housing bubble. Okay, at least they didn't lose $2 trillion on subprime mortgages. That wasn't the government doing that. 
So why do I say the government can only pick winners? Because in innovation, economists have studied this extensively. And what they find is that the average rate of return to society is about twice as big for innovation as it is to the actual innovator. So even though Apple and Steve Jobs made a lot of money innovating, they didn't capture all of the benefits of that innovation. There were what economists call spillovers. Other firms got some of the benefits. We as consumers got a lot of the benefits. And so the private sector doesn't care about spillovers, nor should they care about spillovers. It's not their job to maximize spillovers. It's our job to maximize spillovers. And so only the government, only us collectively, can say, wait a minute, we think we need more innovation because the private sector will underinvest in innovation. And that is an economic sort of truism that economists have agreed on for decades. So thankfully, North Carolina never picked winners. They never did anything so dumb as to create a research park and try to attract technology companies here because everybody knows that North Carolina's competitive advantage was in textiles. You were really good at that, and you should have stayed there. I don't know why you went down this path of doing this thing called the Research Triangle Park or having the North Carolina Biotechnology Center. I mean, geez, why biotechnology? That industry is going nowhere. I don't know what you were thinking. Thankfully, then the federal government never picked winners. Well, except for this little thing called ARPANET, which turned into the Internet, which turned into the greatest technology that's ever been invented by man. So the governments do pick winners. I worked for a Republican governor in, Nor in Rhode Island. We picked winners because we knew that the market alone was not going to help Rhode Island do as well as it could. So let me just say with a caveat now that I've either alienated many of you or intrigued many of you, what I don't mean by that is the government saying, I mean, let me give you an example. We all know that battery technology is going to be an incredibly important technology over the next 30 years. If the only way to solve climate change, you have to get better batteries. So we need a battery policy, like Korea has, like Japan has. But I have no idea what company is it going to be. I don't know. Could it be ever ready? I don't know. It's going to be some company. We know that. I have no idea what company it's going to be, nor does the government, nor can they. We don't even know what technology it's going to be. Is it going to be lithium air? Is it going to be magnesium? We don't know. The government's job is not to pick firms, it's not to pick narrow technologies, but it is to say in broad technology areas, government support for these kinds of things, seeding lots of different ideas, lots of different kinds of partnerships can play a key role. Okay, so in essence what that means is if you want to be successful as a country, or as a state, or even as a city, You've got to get three sides of this triangle right. And when we did our book, one of the things we looked at from all around the world is, is anybody getting all three of these sides right? And the answer is no. But when a country starts to figure out how to get all three of these right, look out. So what are the three things? Business environment. Clearly, you have to have a good tax environment. Clearly, you have to have an entrepreneurial class that is going to want to innovate. Clearly, you need to have top quality managers. Clearly, you need to have a financial system that collects capital and puts it in the right places. You also need a good regulatory environment, which I think my, uh, the next speaker will talk about. You don't want government over-regulating. You don't want government uh, having command and control regulations. I, I think we're seeing that right now, frankly, with what the FCC is doing to move telecom back into a Title II regime. That's over-regulating the Internet. We see it in terms of some of the proposals on privacy where companies that are trying to monetize big data and create real value can face barriers. So you want the regulatory environment to enable innovators. So I've probably now, lots of people would agree with that, but if you just do those two things, you're not going to do enough. You need an innovation policy environment, research and development tax credits, public-private partnerships for R&D, an active STEM education program, real policies to spur tech commercialization from our universities and federal labs. So with that, I will close and uh, encourage you to uh, get this book. Uh, if you want, 
we're, I'm going to be selling this out front for uh, $1.39 cheaper than you can get it on Amazon, $20 uh, at lunch, and I'd be happy to sign copies, and there's free shipping as well. With that, thank you very much.